I take the very long view as a historian, and the last time that I see genuine parity between men and women is around about 1,500 BC. <laughs> so we have three and a half thousand years worth of catching up to do, which is why we are in the state we're in today. And there's all, we can talk about it later, there's all kinds of reasons that I think that actually inequality is in the DNA of civilization. So the real issue is people talk about unconscious bias, but constantly what I see played out in front of me day by day in the broadcasting industry is actually confirmation bias is that people want to be told factual stuff by men. They don't want to be told it by women. I mean, that's really interesting because to name but a few, Liz Bonin, Claire Balding, Kate Humble, there were, Davina McCall, there were plenty of women who presented factual programmes and documentaries this year, and yet they just weren't nominated. Brian, what's your take on that? I remember being very shocked when I was at HBO uh, a few years ago and we had uh, a discussion about who was going to do the commentary on uh, a documentary we'd made called China Stolen Children. And this was a you know, British made documentary, but it was funded largely by HBO and Channel 4. And so the, 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 they were wanting to enter it for the Oscars and they wanted a, a big star to do the voiceover. They wanted something they could put on the poster. Um, and I was sitting there with Sheila Nevin and Nancy Abrahams, who are the, 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 the executive producer and the, the, the senior exec on this at HBO. Sheila Nevin is the sort of goddess of, of American documentary. And we started putting names into the hat. And I suggested a couple of female of, of actresses who I thought might be good. And Sheila said, no, no, it can't be a woman. I don't trust women. <laughs> That's <laughs> so we sort of looked, Kate, Kate Blewett, my, my co-producer and I sort of looked at each other and we looked at Nancy and Nancy sort of looked down. And <laughs> it was this shocking thing of, okay, so it's a male-only shortlist then, is it? Um, mm. And that was it. It was a male-only shortlist. And, you know, we couldn't really argue with that because she was paying the bills and she was the boss. I mean, Toral, do you think there's a sense where female presenters are just not taken seriously? I think there's an element of that, and I think that has been covered in the press, but I also think it's something that's endemic of, of part of our industry generally. There are other areas that women are not equally represented, and I think this is one area of that. You've been working at the BBC, Jill, for the last few years. I mean, I'm amazed that the BBC didn't nominate more women, given that they are trying to actively promote women on screen. Yeah, it seems extraordinary, doesn't it? I don't, I'm not employed by the BBC, I'm freelance, so I'm not party to how they choose. But I thought what Sue Perkins said on the night was so good, you know, that women are just not um, being put forward. It's not the Grierson Trust's fault for not giving them prizes. They weren't there to give, to give a prize to. And that's the BBC, the broadcasters and the Indies, isn't it, who somehow haven't like your person got the trust in the women to be popular enough. Well, but there are so many, well, Mary Beard, I mean, there's so yeah, many people. Mary Beard, Lucy Worthy, <laughs> I mean, we could keep naming people. And, you know, there are plenty of them. There are plenty of women in current affairs as well, you know, who do amazing documentaries from war zones and all sorts of places. So. I think there, there are plenty of it, sorry, but they, it's still not equal. So there still isn't one female presenter for one male presenter. I think it's still on screen, men still outnumber women two to one. So actually there are fewer women to choose from. That shouldn't be the case, but, but that is what happens. And I think it's so interesting what you say about the commentary issue, because again, actually this is Mary Bearded, her great talk about the kind of female voice. And one fact that she missed out of that was one of the reasons that people didn't trust women is that they said that women had higher voices because they were their womb was hysterically <laughs> wandering around their body, whereas men had lower voices because their vocal cords were less sued to their testicles, <laughs> which kind of, you know, kept everything robust. And, you know, I, every time I read that in antiquity, I laugh, and then I cr almost cry, because I think, actually, we're still having that conversation in commissioning yeah. rooms yeah. today, yeah. you know. It's the women are too shrill. Too <laughs> shrill, too shrill. I mean, they're, you know, there are commissioners at the BBC who say women can't do commentary, we, uh, we can't have it. In answer to your point that there's less women within the pool anyway, even that isn't reflected. If you've got, say, hypothetically 30% of women presenters, there aren't 30% of the nominations. So yeah. it's, it's a, a mismatch in terms of who's nominated in the first place. Absolutely. I, mean, I think it is extraordinary that, that or even after the BBC's expert women 
project, which was, I mean, that's been going, what, a couple of years now? Yeah. They've been running that, trying and to bring forward. And even longer than that, for years, the BBC's been trying to get greater diversity yeah. on screen. And you hear again and again, too many middle-aged white men, as a middle-aged white man. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. But it's true, you know, there are far too many middle-aged white men. And you, you turn on these programmes and time and time again, it's another middle-aged white man. And if it's someone, you know, if it's Jeremy Paxman or someone who has forged a career and has a particularly power, then you think, okay, fine. But then when you turn on a program and it's a completely new presenter of, of something that you've never heard of before, that's, that is you know, going into some particular area of science or whatever, and it's another middle-aged white man, you kind of think, well, surely, surely there was someone who wasn't a middle-aged white man who could, who knows about this stuff and who could talk about this. And why, at the, in the commissioning process, did the production company, the commissioners, did no one think well, this is an opportunity here to get someone who isn't a middle-aged white man. Is there an issue, though, that one of the... I mean, we all know ratings is kind of... People aren't driven by ratings, whatever is said, both within the BBC and without. And if the audience isn't used to uh, women presenting it just as a matter of course... I mean, obviously, there are hugely successful female presenters, but there are still more men, and that's what most people in the country have grown up with. Is, is there an issue that actually somebody has to be very bold and say we're confident about being an agent of change? And it might be, for instance, that we get some critical reviews or we see a dip in the ratings, but that's what happens. You know, Faulty Towers had bad ratings, first of all, and it's now a global hit, so you've almost got to roll with the punches a bit. I mean, there are examples. So Lucy Cook, for example, who, who presents Talk to the Animals on BBC One, that was her first... BBC commission, she, she had gone, she'd basically been trying to make it, I know Lucy vaguely, and she'd, she'd been trying to make it in documentaries and it hadn't worked out, and she'd, I saw her at the Sheffield Documentary Festival, and she said, oh, I'm giving up on television, I'm gonna go to South America and work with animals. She went to South America, she started working with sloths, she started making films about sloths, posted them on YouTube, they started getting millions of hits, and then she was spotted, those, those films were spotted by Cassian at the BBC, and that she was commissioned to make a series that went out on three consecutive nights, nine o'clock on BBC One, and is, you know, the new, she's effectively the sort of new Kate Humble. Mm. Can, right. I, can I come back on your point about not being used to women um, presenters and growing up with the male figure? There are new, new, new and new audiences joining every time, and channels are skewed towards certain audiences. So where a traditional audience for BBC Two might be used to, or BBC Four might be an older person used to a male expert or presenter. BBC Three or some of the other smaller channels may not. So I, I'm not sure that there's enough consideration given to the different um, channels and while, when picking their, their presenters. It's but not just a historical. It? Yeah, does nice. it become a self-fulfilling prophecy that the fewer women you have presenting, the less credibility they have? Yeah. Whereas if the public just gets used to the fact yeah. that there are plenty of women presenting, because you know we've had women trailblazing in all sorts of fields. You know there was women CEOs of FTSE 100 companies. Now there yeah. are, uh, you know, we've had a woman prime minister, only one. Uh, but you know, women can break the mould, and once a woman's done it once, then normally it becomes accepted. I think the it's problem is that you always they're always breaking the mould. They're always having to break the mould, and that's that's an issue. It still seems often to be the case that women are brought in to do so-called women subjects, mm -hmm. and um, apart from in news where there are women who do everything. Um, at the same as black presenters are brought in when it's, a, when it's going to be a subject about black history or something particular. And obviously what needs to happen is for women and for black men and women to be used equally with white men as a voice who can talk about everything, not just about their speciality. <laughs> And I think was, that's often the starting point, isn't it? So you've got Ade Adeptan, for example, who comes in initially talking about being used on disabled issues, but then he's now doing dispatches on things that have nothing to do yeah. with disability. You have somebody like Claire Balding, who fought for years to get into the mainstream of mm -hmm. sport, was kind of you know, put in her box as the horse racing presenter. She was allowed to talk about that. And then came into her own the Olympics, and everybody goes, crikey, we've got an amazing female presenter here. But she'd been working in sport for mm -hmm. years. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's that old thing of it took me 20 years to become an overnight <laughs> success. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You do. If you talk to the, to the individuals who are out there, without exception, that you say, what's your secret of your success? And they will all say, I'm just stubborn. Mm -hmm. I just wouldn't. I refuse to go away, even though I was having more and more <laughs> obstacles you know, put in my way. So it would be a great 
time when actually we're not having to do that. But And I think things are changing very fast. As you say, there's a kind of exponential rate. I mean, there's a, you know, just one kind of tiny anecdote. 20 years ago, I was presenting a program about Dionysiac rights, and I was interviewing a circus performer who was naked from the waist downwards on a trampoline. <laughs> and I was eight and a half months pregnant. And the director was tying himself into knots, not so that he didn't see this silly penis waving around. He was fine with that. He didn't want to show my bum <laughs> on the screen. And I just, I was saying, what are you doing? He said, oh, well, you know, that's a bit, ooh. Yeah, so they, hey, the wheel is, the wheel is fine. But, but that wouldn't happen now. So, you know, that has changed and there are more women. So I think we've just got to, what we've got to work out is how we continue the momentum so that we don't need to be having conversations like this. As you say, it is just a natural part of the, part of the course that you see women up there. But we do have to work out what it is, what root and branch changes there are that need to be made so that it is just, as we say, a, a, a clearly a kind of natural and right evolution of, for the industry. But Should we think, just move I on now to behind the camera? Yeah. Mm. Because, okay, so on the one hand, we, had, we only had one entrant for um, presenter, one female entrant for presenter, um, but it was notable last week on stage there were hardly any women getting up there getting awards. Um, I think, Bethany, you said it was four out of 104. That's not, that is not very good. And, you know, despite your historical perspective, we are now in 2014. We expect slightly more than that in an industry where women are not that underrepresented. So what's going on, Jill? Why aren't women winning awards? Well, it was so surprising, wasn't it? Because I was surprised at myself because I didn't notice until I was travelling home that there hadn't been any women go up to the microphone and make an acceptance speech. I thought that can't be true and I got out my program and looked through and realised that the only women who went up on stage to get a prize were the legendary Norma Piercy, Percy who was um, there in a group of five and I think it was the owner of the company who made the acceptance speech and um, somebody in the ed Educating Yorkshire team was, was a woman and other than that well, they didn't speak so there was no female spoke accepting a prize all evening, which if it had been the other way around, can you just imagine if all that, <laughs> if everybody who'd gone up to get a prize and accept it had been a woman, it would have been sort of all over the tabloids, it would have been a great big story, it would seem an extraordinary thing. Um, um, Brian Lapping and even said Obviously that often women do win, I've, I've won myself, we've, you know, people have won before, but uh, it was remarkable that there could be a year when they didn't. And Brian Lapping the person who took the award for Norma Percy, <laughs> accepted the award for Norma Percy, did himself say that he wasn't afraid to steal the glory. Mm. And you think, OK, well, why? why not let Norma, who is hardly a shy retiring wallflower, who's made many a brilliant acceptance speech, go up there? And we from the Grierson Trust rang Norma, and she said, because it had been a team making it, albeit that maybe she was the leader of it, but then it was a team effort. She hadn't wanted it to seem like she was trying to steal the limelight. So she sort of said to Brian, well, why don't you do it? And expecting him to go, no, 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 of course, you must go up and get the award. And he'd leapt at this opportunity with alacrity. And she said the moment he started speaking, she <laughs> resented and regretted the fact that she hadn't put herself forward. I mean, is this typical of women, do you think? I think women are less pushy. They're, they, they've got less bluff. They, they don't, they're not self-promoting. Is that because women aren't making, if you like, in, to put them in inverted commas, serious programmes, do you think, Brian? I think that uh, it's more to do with, with being pushy, to be honest. I mean, I know several of the films that we've, we're making, which are very serious, are made by women. Um, and that's there's no shortage of directors who, producer directors who are making great films. I think it may be the, an issue of seeking to self-promote that is, 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 I mean it's difficult isn't it, you kind of want to make ge great gender generalizations, particularly as the only man on the panel. Are women naturally self-deprecating? Is that part of the problem? Well, I mean, it's so interesting listening to this, and I almost don't want to open my mouth, because exactly as you say, there is a real... What we're trying to get away from is gender stereotyping and saying all women are like this and all men are like that. And you, it, we shouldn't be have, talking in those kind of terms, really. And yet, there has to be a reason. As you say, there has to be a reason. Women are 50% of the population, and we are not re represented either in content or in terms of personnel in front of or behind the, the camera. So there has to be a reason 
You know, there is something going on that means there's a reason for that. I'm not sure if women are self-deprecating. What, what I've noticed um, in factual filmmaking is the number of directors who've said to me, oh, it's really interesting, the women I work with, the presenters, you always want to go through the script and add a lot of your own and change things and really fact check and sort of they're almost complaining because they say actually a lot of the guys they just ask for it a couple of days in advance or even on the day and just sort of say things and you kind of think oh yeah that's really annoying of us and you think actually no that means that what those men are doing forgive me because I love and respect men but what those men are doing is basically very confidently bullshitting their way through a script and I wonder and I, I mean, it's a very interesting philosophical question. I wonder if one of the things with television is that, as a storytelling medium, we like bold statements. We don't like qualification. We like a kind of juggernaut of narrative. We like big ideas. We don't like to kind of nibble around the edges. And whether there maybe is a predisposition for women to think, actually, let's look at this holistically and let's kind of really kind of, is that tiny detail actually right? So it's almost a kind of positive thing rather than a negative one, but whether that is causing some tension within the industry in kind of big terms, not just an individual personnel terms. I mean, as I said, I sort of can't believe I'm saying this really because I don't want to put us into these into these stereotypical boxes. But but as we said at the beginning, there is a problem. We've got to find a solution. So we've got to work out what it is structurally that needs to, to change. But, I, I but when there are multiple directors, Jill, there might be one woman and say three men. Why should the men be making the speech and not the woman? Well, they shouldn't, obviously. <laughs> And if there's you know, a woman director and a presenter, then it, the Grierson in particular is a filmmaker's prize and it's only right that the woman producer-director should make the speech. And there is a, as you said, a tendency for, and Norma said it, you know, tendency for women to sort of stand back a bit, not, not want to be pushy, want to say, you know, but, but she said she wanted to be given the chance, but she, somehow she felt she had to offer it to him. And then there's the question of the kind of content that tends to win prizes, which in the past used to very much be overseas films, films about war, about big conflicts, big issues and often women didn't get those jobs so much, either didn't push themselves forward for them or weren't offered them by the people who were offering the jobs and women would be doing the so-called softer things yeah. and that's why I was particularly surprised this year because there are categories now where Educating Yorkshire and all sorts of films can win awards and still yeah. the winner women <laughs> can, can I come because back? those are the things that women have traditionally done and been particularly good at you know and a lot of the idea in people's minds out there is that documentary is a, a field that is very welcoming to women and that we're good at it because we're good at talking to people and listening and many of the things that documentaries need you to be good at as well as telling a story and shaping the thing and make, bringing it through to completion. Do you think Jill the fact that women have children has any any role to play in the fact that we don't well that the women are disappearing? I get the feeling that it does um, I had a um, message just last week after, after I'd written about the, um, what happened at Grissom and the lack of women there. Somebody saying that somebody, a high up man from the BBC who talks about economics a lot, a lot on television, I don't know who she meant, had come to her college a while ago admittedly and said that television is not a job to go into if you want to have children. And obviously this had stuck with her. And I felt that was you know, a pretty terrible thing to say because obviously most men in television many men in television, probably the majority of straight men anyway have children, some of the gay men too. And it is harder for women to carry on in a job like producing and directing their own films when they have children. I have children and I managed, but I can't say that it was at all easy. And I did notice a lot of other people, other women dropping out. And it still seems to be the case that they drop out and often don't come back, or come back to a job that they find not as demanding as producing and directing. What do you think, Tom? Um, well, I think that there's a number that do, you know, that leave the industry, and I think there's a number of men that leave the industry because of the demands that it makes on you and your social life and your family life. But I think the kind of women that become directors tend to be the kind of women that are have childcare and those kind of arrangements arranged well in advance and some even welcome the fact that it's a concentrated period of work after which they can then devote several months to being at home with their children but I think it's a choice that women should be allowed to make rather than have dictated to them and very often I think 
these additional roles, edit producing or producing or uh, uh, jobs that uh, women take up because that's what's available. Because of this um, vulnerability that they have in the, in the marketplace as being women, I think they don't often get the choice of, of going and staying within a directing route. They have to work, they have to earn and because of the way that the industry is starting to split or has split, the opportunities available to them are in edit producing. But and do the they choice not take they... those roles so that they can have more reliable hours, more consistent hours, or so that they don't have to travel? To a degree. To, I think some, some do, some clearly do, but not as many as there are edit producers. I think the, the industry loses people for all sorts of reasons, and some it's a temporary loss and they come back. Some can't come back because they've been out of the that creative industry for such a long time that the industry's moved on, so we lose women there. But some of it is just lack of opportunity. I talk to I young women quite a lot who are on... I talk to young women who are on very short contracts, and they are worried about what they're going to be able to do because they won't get maternity pay because the, cons the contracts are so short. I think that's, that's a key yeah. issue, isn't it? Because I, I've been trying to check the statistic, but somebody said to me that 70% of all people involved in the generation of BBC programmes are actually freelance. Mm. And that, so those are people who have zero security. Yeah. No, no yeah. they're not even paid for weekends, let yeah. alone for any kind of maternity care you know, or pension. Well, so that needs to be sorted, that, isn't it? That shift's happened in the last... 10, 15 years, that, yeah. that shift towards the increasing casualisation, increasing freelancers, more and more programmes being made by indies, and indies, particularly small indies, uh, it's, a real, you know, it's a real challenge when you've got people going off on maternity leave. But then if you go back 20 years to the time when actually most people worked for the BBC, had staff contracts long term and could take two years off and have their job guaranteed, the fact is it's probably isn't it better now than it was then? Well, 20 years ago, can I just say, you only got six months off and only okay. three months of it was paid. Yeah. <laughs> she said <laughs> you know, no, no, not at all, but the yeah. fact is, maternity provision has improved hugely, mm. but what's changed in our industry is casualisation. Far fewer people of both genders in full-time permanent employment, mm -hmm. and mm. many, many more on freelance contracts where you don't get maternity mm. leave. Yeah. Um, and your, the unpredictability of your work could militate against you having a steady income. Mm. But what I'm saying is that in, uh, 20 years ago, when there, was those, the, when there were those guarantees, when you could go off on maternity leave and have your, uh, your job guaranteed back, the fact is that those women didn't now come through to sort of senior positions. Some of them did. <laughs> come through to senior positions in the BBC. We, you know, we've still got the problem. Mm. Yeah. And yet now we've got this additional issue of a lack of that security. Yes, mm -hmm. and that needs to be, what we need to check is, as you were saying, kind of the freelancing is good, but we need to check that it's not prejudicial, prejudicial against the women who are involved as freelancers and therefore giving up careers because they think they just can't do it because mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of the kids as well, yeah. Shall we just say, what next? What are we all gonna do <laughs> about it? We accept there's an issue. How can we crack it? Bethany. Um, well, that is the, the critical question, isn't it? There are interesting schemes uh, quotas have been talked about. Uh, I'm not a fan of quotas, but there's a very interesting scheme in Finland where they're the publicly um, financed film and television. 50% of that money has to be spent on female employees or female freelancers. So that doesn't mean you're asking for quotas, but 50% of the money has to go into women's pockets. And that's quite an interesting idea, that if you think that actually it's 50% of us who are kind of paying for it, so obviously it should be 50% benefiting from it. Um, I think, radically, I think the whole industry needs a root and branch change and that yeah. we actually need to change not just on paper but in our hearts. I think we all need to walk into every room and think are we actually giving everyone a fair voice here at every point in the commissioning and production process and if we don't do that it's going to take another 1,500 years for us to reach that level of parity. So I think it is down, it's, it's one of those things, it's not a them, it's an us solution that every one of us in the industry has to be very vocal about it, not shrill, mm -hmm. just kind of <laughs> vocal and clear and try to kind of work a way through so that, because it has to change, you know, we cannot have a system, particularly when British programmes sell around the world, where it's either the male voice, either as a, as a director or as an on-screen person that is delivering ideas and 
and attitudes to the world. That cannot be a good state of affairs. But it tends to has to come from the top, doesn't it? Really, I mean, if you've got commissioning edit um, commissioning editors and exec producers, and all the way down the line that are, are made to somehow reflect a more diverse community and made to do it. And I, I, I'm actually I'm in favour of quotas, and I'm, mm. I'm probably quite unpopular in that and I'm in a minority in that. I think until the playing field is absolutely leveled, you do need some form of either a softer approach to enforce it or even a harder you know, role. And that could be by making it part of the commissioning or compliance or some, some necessary way of enforcing some kind of better balance. Because, um, Brian, there's no shortage of women in the decision-making process mm. and commissioning, is there? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the BBC, if you look at BBC documentaries at the moment, it's, it's entirely female. Um, if you look at uh, Channel 4 Current Affairs, it, it, Siobhan and, and, and Dorothy are there. Dorothy's the head of the department. So there are plenty of women in those decision-making roles. I mean, in terms of quotas, I, personally, I think that the risk of a quota is that then you end up with not necessarily the best person being yeah, well, chosen yeah. for the job. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. targets in a way yeah. are subtly different to yeah. quotas mm -hmm. and I think targets are a really good idea and I think mm -hmm. that particularly when as, as, as commissioners are increasingly becoming involved in the selection of PDs which didn't used to happen much in my experience and it's, it is increasingly happening now that, that, that the commissioners are wanting to know well give me a, give me a shortlist then I think that there should be a rule that you know you have to have Men and women on that shortlist. You know, you shouldn't have. You shouldn't be able to put to. Is okay. Yeah, you're right. Okay, the target. We should have a target. Yeah. Target is a more fashionable word, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and the idea of having a quota for awards would sort of make most oh, of us kind of feel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you yeah, wouldn't want to feel agree. you'd won the Grist yeah, or the Royal Temple no. Society award. because you were a woman. You've got the black person's award. But lower, no, but at the entry level target seems like an excellent idea. But the point with the entry levels is that the women do okay with. Grierson's at entry level, mm -hmm. it's transfer, you know, it's, it's converting those entry levels into the higher accolades, mm -hmm. if you like, of the more established directors. Mm -hmm. That's where they fall down. They do, uh, you know, over the last five, six years, they've had an incredible record at mm -hmm. newcomer level. It's mm -hmm. just making sure that that talent is nurtured and given the opportunity to work their way through the system. And I think until they're given the level of experience building programs until they can cut their teeth on smaller and smaller programs within that genre it's not going to happen and I think you're still going to have a diluted sort of pool of, of female directors. Okay so I'm going to give the last word to our historian. Put oh. it into a perspective. <laughs> 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 we haven't got to wait another three and a half thousand years oh. have we? Buddy? Okay well I tell you what well, let's do it with words because we're a business of kind of words and ideas and there's a very interesting word which is man you know we all part of the brotherhood of man. What man originally meant was a thing with a brain a thinking thing and it gives us the word mind. It's got nothing to do with having a penis so I think that we ought to champion an industry where we are creating and supporting thought and the transmission of thought and of ideas by all of mankind, not just by gendered men. So thank you so much to everybody on the panel today. I think it's been a really interesting discussion. Please, people, send in your applicants with female directors, female presenters to the Grierson's next year. And the BAFTAs as well. The and the BAFTAs, BAFTAs and the RTSs Craft Awards. And <laughs> the BAFTA Craft everything. Awards are open now. You can, you can enter yourself if you want to. You and can lobby your producers to enter you. And let's please put women in a position where they can work up to being considered seriously for these awards in the first place. It would be great if we were the generation that were seen as choosing to open minds rather than to close them, wouldn't it?